Um, welcome this morning to Preservation Futurists. I'm Marissa Brown. I'm a lecturer in public humanities and the assistant director for programs at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage at Brown University. I also serve on the state review board for the State Historic Preservation Office, so I'm really pleased to be here to support the work of the agency um, and be here for today's conference as well. Before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We'd like to acknowledge the Narragansett, Wampanoag, and Niantic peoples on whose traditional, ancestral, unceded lands the state of Rhode Island currently exists. We deliver this land acknowledgement to recognize the historical legacy of colonialism by honoring and paying respect to the land and to the, and to the Narragansett, Wampanoag, and Niantic communities today. We do it to raise greater public consciousness of native sovereignty, political and cultural rights, and the issue of restitution, and to commit ourselves to truth telling about the past, to structural change, and to restorative justice. Um, so it's exciting to be here uh, with two preservation and arts visionaries. We will be hearing first from Jasmine Lee Johnson, who is a visual artist, scholar, composer, and curator. She received her BFA in film, animation, and video at RISD, her MA in public humanities at Brown University. She is currently a music mentor to teens at New Urban Arts and the inaugural artist in residence at the Rhode Island Department of Health and it was a 2020 Artist Fellow at the RISD Museum. We will be hearing next from Tracy Johnson LeBoy, who is the founding director of Newport Art House, an organization she co-founded in 2015. Um, she plans, manages, uh, and manages multiple grant-funded multimedia public projects involving contemporary artist interventions in historic spaces in Newport, Rhode Island. Tracy has a BS and an MS in Historic Preservation from the School of Art History, Architecture, and Historic Preservation at Roger Williams University. Um, so we will have time for questions and conversations and are really hoping for this to be as interactive as technology uh, allows. Um, thanks again for taking part, uh, taking uh, taking time from what was yesterday, actually a beautiful spring day. Today's a little chilly, so a nice day to be cozy inside um, and hearing from these two visionaries. So um, a note about housekeeping, you'll see on the right, uh, there are some options for chat. Feel free to use the chat box during the presentation, but if you have questions, please put those into the Q&A box. When we come to the end, I will be reading from questions from the Q&A box and moderating some conversation with, um, with our speakers. Okay, so this panel explores the theme of preservation and the arts, considering the generative ways in which arts interventions can transform or challenge dominant narratives at historic sites. It includes a survey of inspiring projects in the field, a deep dive into one artist's work at historic sites and archives in New England, and a toolkit for how to create and manage um, projects like this. So um, why sort of, you know, what, what is happening um, in terms of this relationship between contemporary art and historic spaces and preserved sites? There's been an incredible rise in projects that invite artists to create site-specific work in these historic and preserved sites. Um, we can see the volume of projects that are happening um, at these sites and attention to this new field of practice at conferences like this one, um, in the media, in courses and programs at universities that have preservation schools and departments, and in new funding streams from foundations. So there are a lot of different reasons for this convergence, some of which I'm sort of listing right here. Contemporary art installations and performances bring in new audiences, and they allow historic and preserved sites to address some of the most important issues of the day, especially issues related to social and racial justice. These collaborations can be a dynamic way to offer new perspectives on a site, 
especially from communities who have been strategically and purposely silenced, or whose voices have not been included in the stories that have been told about specific sites. At the same time, there's increasing interest on the part of artists, um, uh, sorry, on the part of artists who are working in historic sites as a way to tell critical or counter histories. I'm sorry, one second. Here we go. Uh, and to expose hidden or, un or unacknowledged truths. This springs in part from developments within art making, from the rise of site specific art to the interest in participatory or social practice art. Some of this work is inspired by the Columbia University scholar Sadia Hartman, who writes of the need for, quote, critical fabulation. Um, that's work that includes elements of fiction or fabulation but that is grounded in historical research. Given the gap in historical records and archives, especially when it comes to communities of color and women. What excites me about this development as an art historian and as someone who thinks about the history and practice of preservation is that we are seeing artists stepping out in front of historians and showing us how powerful it can be to think about history through art. Here I'm showing you Reggie Black's no, Retro, no Records, which projected the words, slaves lived here on the farmhouse facade. It was part of the museum's programmatic focus on the lives of six enslaved black people who lived and labored in the house. With the Dickman farmhouse, this is a quote from Reggie Black about the project. With the Dickman farmhouse being the oldest slave farmhouse in New York City, it was important to make sure that people knew that this was an actual location where slaves lived, Black said. For a long time, it has been the task of historians to revise our understanding of history. But these artists are doing work that may achieve these ends in the way that is more dynamic and possibly more forceful. It's not just changing how we think about the past in an analytical way, it's going deeper. It's changing our mental landscape of the past. It's changing our collective memory. The reality is that the histories we have told and the sites we have preserved tell stories about white elites for the most part. They tend to erase or ignore the contributions and lives of communities of color, of the poor and of women. Artists working in historic sites today are training our eyes on people and events that existed, but were not always acknowledged. In this way, they're changing history. Here I'm showing you Yinka Shonabari's colonial arrangements, which reflects on colonial trade, including slavery, racial caricature, and social hierarchies through the placement of sculpture in the museum's period rooms. Closer to home, the Strange Attractor Theater Company created work for two historic sites in Providence in 2018 and 2019. In 2018, they staged the ground floors of the Lippet House with artifacts, lighting, documents, and sound installations around the theme of labor history, which is often hidden in historic homes like the Lippet. And in 20, 2019, they created what they called a coral haunting bringing back to life the women who labored at Paragon Mill in the late 19th century through the mid 20th when it closed. Both projects invited visitors to see these historic sites from a fresh perspective. And for many who attended either event, um, and I attended Lippet House installation, I'm sure there are many today in the audience who attended one or both of these events, they really changed the way we will think about these spaces forever. If we look to the work of our next two speakers, okay, if we work, look to the work of our next two speakers, we may start to think that Rhode Island is incubating quite a lot of work in this new field. The next speaker, Jasmine Lee Johnson, will talk about her artistic practice in relation to history, archives, and historic sites. And then we will hear from Tracy Johnson LeBoy, who will offer her reflections as a curator and project manager on what it takes to create these partnerships. It will be a fun ride. Thanks for being here with us this morning. Um, and remember, we will have time for questions and conversation at the end. So just use the, the Q&A box on the right if you've got questions. Over to Jasmine.
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, uh, Marissa. And thank you, everyone, for being here um, this morning and sharing digital space with us. I'm going to take a moment and um, share my screen really quickly. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Great. Um, so there'll be a chance to participate momentarily. Um, and if, if you haven't already, please locate the chat box. Um, today, I'm going to speak generally about my creative practice and share some work with you, two archive-driven projects and two site-specific projects. And there's a lot I want to share, so apologies if I go quickly. Um, hopefully, I can get it all in. Uh, but let's start off with some word association. So um, take a look at the image that's been up on the screen. Process it in the chat box. Um, Please, if you will, share the first word or two that comes to mind. Unfortunately, I cannot see anyone in my chat box anymore. Um, so if someone, uh, Marissa, maybe could you share some of the things that um, people have typed? Yeah, so far what I'm seeing is happy and abundance. <laughs> Braces, joyful. Youth, cash, flexing. All right, and I'm going to switch now to this image, which you can just ponder upon, but take it in. Um, yeah, so this first image is an image of my cousin. Uh, and the second image is an image of a Civil War uh, envelope. So I am currently working on a series called Contraband, um, which is work inspired by my research at the American Antiquarian Society up in Worcester. Uh, so I'll share a few um, images uh, from my research in the reading room um, as I speak more on Contraband. So Contraband puts in conversation the business of slavery, uh, the commodification of blackness, black labor, black bodies. Um, puts that in conversation with contemporary connections of prison industry and illegal economies, uh, specifically drug dealings in black urban neighborhoods in Baltimore. Um, during the Civil War, those who escaped slavery and made their way to Union territory were considered illegal goods, remaining in limbo for the course of the war. There were even contraband camps in Virginia. As part of my research, I examined 19th century currency Civil War envelopes, black codes, children's books, uh, broadsides, arithmetic books, ledgers um, of slavers, and so much more. Uh, I personally believe that Civil War contraband, slave codes, black codes, which were laws that restricted black bodies, i.e. when you could be in public, how much land you could own, marriage, etc. cetera. I think these things set the precedent for curb culture uh, curfews, maximum minimum sentencing, state-sponsored violences, and limitations on Black freedoms um, today. So the first piece that I completed um, as a part of this series is a print um, titled after this Instagram post, Free My Twin, Fuck the Law, Cop Car uh, Water Gun Emoji. So with their permission, I begin with drawings from my cousin's Instagram posts and layer, 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 layer them um, with images from the archive. I then turn those into stencils, which then become uh, print, printed media. So you'll see here, and I'm sorry to be moving so quickly, but some of the uh, ephemera as well as my own drawings. Um, and I'll zoom into this image a little bit um, just to show 
use some of the motifs of, uh, you know, a currency converter of looted sculptures um, from West Africa, uh, of the motif of, a, of bodies stacked in a slave ship, um, et cetera. Here is one close up. And here is another close up. Again, same idea. This is actually a current piece that I'm working on, inspired by um, this Instagram post. And same process. Uh, here, I am making a nod more so to uh, a stamp, but again, it includes looted sculptures, um, both topsy turvy imagery of um, young black children and contemporary imagery and a whole lot uh, in between. What I want to talk about um, is one of the main methodologies that I use as an artist, which is remix, not a new term. I see remix as a form of discourse, um, as a practical tool, um, a process of decolonizing the racialized body and deconstructing history. So briefly, the word, word remix is a synthesis of um, the prefix re um, and the root mix. And it basically means to mix something again. Um, so music is commonly remixed. Memes are popular visual forms of remix. Um, when remixing, one usually goes to a primary source, takes an element of it, um, and combines that with something else. Which brings me to the next uh, body of work that I'll share briefly, which is revolting. And I just want to give a quick warning. There are some images that show um, weapons and depict moments of mistreatment in the context of um, 18th century slavery. So my series Revolting uh, is based on research uh, I did of John Gabriel Stedman's narrative, five, um, narrative of a five years expedition against the revolted Negroes of Suriname. And I'll get into that in a second, but I want to read this caption um, below, which says, from different parents, different climes we came, at different periods, fate still rules the same. Unhappy youth while bleeding on the ground was yours to fall, but mine to fill the wound. And that's pretty problematic, right? I'll say. So Stedman was a part of, excuse me, a cohort of European soldiers um, in the late 18th century sent to Suriname to regain control of the colony. Um, I was drawn to this text, this narrative, because Stedman did a series of sketches that he then had artist and poet William Blake turn into engravings. And at the John Carter Brown Library, they have 11 um, editions of this. Um, there are over 80 engravings in the narrative itself. So for me, it felt like an early um, graphic novel. Uh, one of the um, pieces that I created um, in response to the narrative is this piece here um, called Flea Plantation. And it's inspired by an account um, early on in the text where Stedman is a guest of a plantation, at a plantation owner's house. And dinner is interrupted by a message that there's been an insurrection of 25 slaves in the, a nearby plantation. Excuse me. So this is my depiction of that. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, it shows actually 25 figures uh, who are dancing, rejoicing, overwhelmed, um, running. Uh, their skin is, is in the style of some of the plants and such you would find in Suriname. And uh, at the top, they're setting things ablaze. Um, there is no imagery in Stedman's narrative that shows the revolts and successes of the Maroons and the enslaved people in Suriname at the time. And we never hear directly from them in the text. And I felt, as I often do, compelled to redress that absence of voice and perspective. Um, and this, as Marissa mentioned earlier, is a process inspired by Sadia Hartman's um, critical fabulation. Um, and in the interest of time, I won't go too deeply into it, but here is a quote um, from Sadia Hartman's Venus in Two Acts, uh, where she speaks of critical fabulation and describes it here. Um, so the fabula can be read as the fundamental 
parts of a story and the components of a narrative. And the, the critical aspect of critical fabulation is a combination of um, remixing history by use of facts, evaluation, desires, um, analytics, empowerment, and filling the holes of history, really. Um, so, yeah. I want to move on to the last piece um, that I'll share with you from um, Revolting. And there's a lot more, but I'll share this one and move on. Um, this is Joanna. Um, and Joanna's relationship with Stedman is a complicated one. Some will call her his concubine. Some might argue otherwise. Um, they had a child together. Stedman eventually took their son back to Europe and sent for Joanna, but she never came. Not sure if that's a sign of the times or what. Um, but I imagine Joanna surrounded by slavery in Suriname and seeing Stedman as a way out of servitude. So I created this um, animated loop called Joanna Twerk Left. And basically, I see this Joanna using her sexuality to dance around the gallows pole um, to move away from slavery, maybe twerking for Stedman's desires or twerking for survival. Um, like I said, there are many more pieces, uh, but um, you'll have to go to my website to see more on that. And Lastly, I just want to mention uh, two site-specific projects um, that I'm working on, um, actually starting in May. Uh, so the first one is at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities at, uh, and Cultural Heritage um, at Brown. Um, there I'll be utilizing the methods that I mentioned, which are remix, a redress, and juxtaposition to create a response to this uh, racist, idyllic wallpaper, um, a vue de d'Amérique de Nord, excuse my French, um, views of North, the views of North America. Um, so here's a view of the wallpaper um, in the actual face. And here is a close-up of a couple of the depictions, um, representations of uh, black people and native peoples in the um, wallpaper. So I am eager to respond to this and to um, challenge and be in dialogue with this imagery. Uh, the other site specific project is um, at the Joshua Hempstead House in um, Connecticut, which is a historic house museum. Um, there, Joshua Hempstead employed a black man named Adam Jackson, who lived um, in the attic. And um, he actually kept a diary um, just of all his business and going ons over the years. And there's very, very, very um, much detail about Adam's work. Um, but I think we can all conclude that Adam was, in fact, enslaved. So I'll be reimagining the space um, in the attic. Uh, where some of Adam's things are left behind, again, using redress, remix, and critical fabulation. Um, and here are just some early ideas of what I might do in this space. I might do something with, um, with print, uh, printing on silk, to show Adam's labor, as well as Adam's family and other going-ons. Um, yeah. But I will leave you all with that. And thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to pass it on to Tracy. Awesome. Thank you, Jasmine, so much. That was such a treat. Um, let me pull up my presentation here for a second. All right, folks, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Tracy Johnson Lavoy. I'm a cultural strategist, arts planner, and facilitator living in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and I'm the funding director of Newport Art House, as mentioned, uh, as well as an independent cultural consultant. Um, 
I consider myself first and foremost, however, a teacher and a practicing artist. Uh, in this slide, you should be able to see uh, some of my uh, students throughout the years. Uh, and lately, I've been hired to facilitate some of um, our region's difficult conversations around the arts and cultural plans for the city of Providence, as well as working for the Providence, uh, Imagine Downtown Providence redesign team uh, as a public meeting facilitator. Um, my educational background, however, is actually in historic preservation, as mentioned. Here are some orgs that I've had the pleasure of working for in the years past, um, mainly as a front uh, desk type of person, interacting with visitors, uh, as well as uh, a back-end researcher and curatorial assistant. I wasn't always a historian, though, and I'm one of the lucky few people, I think, in the universe who had their first impactful uh, conversation with history documented uh, with images as well as a very random New York Times article where I, as a 21-year-old, uh, talk about very random things. But I was working for uh, an organization called Rocking the Boat in the Bronx, uh, and we were hired by Phillipsburg Manor in Tarrytown, New York, to come up and build a boat on site in period garb. Um, I'm not even sure what year this was. I was 19. Um, and I was the boat builder assistant for this program, so my main priority, as you can see on the picture of the right, was finishing the boat while managing 16 kids uh, who were building the boat with me. Um, but in the process of completing this project, which really I had no say in, uh, my interest in history grew specifically as it related to wearing a corset and boat building at the same time, which, as you can imagine, is not conducive. Um, but um, Little did I know, and I figured this out by Googling myself a couple years later, that the National Endowment for the Humanities had used my personal story from Phillipsburg Manor to Roger Williams uh, Historic Preservation Program as an argument to secure funding uh, in 2014. So I feel especially empowered um, to uh, even propose to be an authority on the topic of pipelining future cultural consumers and stakeholders. And I can surmise my observations so far, uh, generally and in no uh, mean way here, just as a, a one preservationist to a group of other preservationists and art lovers, my observation to date has been that our sector seems to be in denial about what future historians uh, want to experience at historical sites. Uh, and I think this is really unfortunate, and I'm glad we're all here today to kind of solve that problem. I say denial because most cultural workers really do understand what it means to have an experience at a cultural site. It's what makes our job so amazing. Um, here are some pictures of me just randomly uh, interacting with history by being a cultural worker, surveying on the Appalachian Trail, having a moment of introspection at the Isaac Bell House. Um, I got to get dirty. I got to have my own personal experience. I was encouraged to contribute to the interpretation of the sites. Uh, and, and converse with visitors uh, and people who are uh, really present in these places uh, as a cultural worker. No wonder I'm attached to historical sites. Um, I really do get to experience them. Uh, in order to create buy-in from community members who fund the preservation of historic sites, uh, we treat them to extremely curated uh, experiences that often do involve art. Um, and uh, we realize that these experiences are important in emphasizing what about our sites uh, really matter and how people are truly contributing to their survival, to the survival of sites. So um, I wondered in my work so far why we do this for ourselves and for our funders uh, and we treat our visitors so differently. Um, this is a funny slide because a year ago, I'm sure none of you guys, or maybe some of you, uh, not all of you, would have identified with this as a home environment, but take a look at us now. Um, this is what we leave our houses uh, to go do fun things outside. Uh, we have lots of screens. Uh, there's no novelty in uh, uh, a headset anymore. Uh, and then we go out to a historical site and we're offered another device. Um, similarly, on an emotional level, um, this is a characterization. Um, but essentially, we are, um, you know, experiencing in our emotional lives uh, a distrust for existing narratives and interpretations from a generation that seemed way out of touch, in our opinion. Uh, and then we go to a historical site to be treated to a similar perspective. And um, I think there is something that we need to address in this. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to share with you what I want from a historical site. 
as a millennial, as a woman, as a person of color, I'm interested in historical sites uh, and we'll talk about them uh, with great enthusiasm if they provide an experience that's authentic and asks me uh, to process with other people the burden that I feel our generation faces in solving all of these social issues. If you manage to make it fun, uh, then I am there and I will pay prime money for it. Um, introduction to millennials. Uh, when I was in school, no one wanted to hear about this, but now I think we're also old actually. Uh, but millennials are the America's the largest population and the oldest ones of us are in our 40s now, so come on. Um, we represent 1.8 billion in consumer spending and 82% of us spend that money on experiences. We are the future stewards of your sites. Uh, and the question for our cultural institutions are if you understand us and if you understand Gen Z, because they're the future, future stewards of your site. I'll help you out. Here are some of our uh, priorities. Again, purchase experiences over uh, objects. We're not getting pools or houses. Um, we look for things we can trust, um, experiences that offer some accountability. We hate being lied to, and we really respect self-reflection. So as a historical site, are you offering experiences that support contemporary causes, communicate your accountability, offer a truth, and acknowledge gaps in diversity and understanding? Um, in my experience, some of the sites in Rhode Island are working on this, and others really need to work on it. Um, and what I see is, unfortunately, a writing on the wall for those who don't. And this sounds very critical, but it's kind of a little tough love in a sense. So what you do uh, by engaging contemporary artists in the process of uh, uh, interpreting your site is you create an emotional arc. It can be time-based, it can be a residency, it can be an evening, it can be a series, um, but you're creating cognitive understanding uh, for, the, for the social issues that are kind of the undercurrents of every, every historical site. Uh, and so if you're not an expert at creating emotional arcs uh, with the narration that you have available to you through your curatorial department, um, you can hire people who have, who have that in their core competency, and those people truly are artists. Um, they're, they're very happy to serve um, whatever prompt you will give them if you put it out there in a way that uh, inspires them, and they will really uh, help you reach what I call the temporal surround sound. Uh, we're so lucky that we're in this field of, experience, uh, of art and in history. Uh, it, the experience economy is going to, it's, it's already been a thing forever, but we're coming out of quarantine. It's going to absolutely boom. Even you boomers recognize that you're having screen fatigue and that you want to you feel things in spaces. Uh, when you combine art and history, you really do give people an opportunity to both emotionally, cognitively, and chronologically experience your space in their own time. And this is magic that my generation and probably you two will pay premium prices for as well as uh, get very funded to do. Um, so I've operated within this gap at, through my work at Newport Art House since 2015, uh, living in Newport, realizing that there isn't someone organizing this bridge between the cultural institutions and the arts community, both of whom seem eager to meet. Uh, in the last six years, I conducted uh, just under 50 different uh, public event, paid and unpaid, uh, funded, uh, some of them funded by the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, other by the Rhode Island Council for uh, the Arts, uh, most of which, though, did, um, uh, were funded by the people who attended the events. Um, we've raised around $5,000 in just ticket, I mean, excuse me, $50,000 in ticket prices alone by the patrons and the young folks that come to our events. So they're willing to uh, they're willing to pay for an experience, and uh, artists at historical sites is just such a wonderful opportunity to uh, to engage. So if you're a historical site and you're thinking, well, you know, obviously a contemporary art is amazing, but what can we do here? Maybe you have a small farmhouse, like Cogshaw Farm is one of my favorite examples. Um, you can ask me privately about my experience there. But a really great way to figure out what you could do with artists at your site is really Think about things you would not customarily allow uh, a visitor to do, or things that you would discourage people to do. I'll mention a few. Uh, take off their shoes, uh, eat an ice cream, right? Sit in circle, sit in a circle in the middle of your space and talk, doodle emotions and process. Uh, and this is a big one, lay down and heal. If you have any type 
of racial injustice or any type of difficult topics that you want to address at your site, why not give people an opportunity to experience it in a healing manner? I think this, I want to go to an event like this somewhere. Um, is there any circumstance where this behavior that obviously you don't want to see every day may be embraced somewhere on your property during a time-based curated um, experience? I'm going to give us some uh, some examples here. What you're looking at are just Newport Art House events throughout. And then Abram, um, Marina Abramovich is a genius because she doesn't do anything. She just shows up. And by being an artist in a space that sits and looks at people, she's offering a different experience from staring at a beautiful painting. Uh, and that's what artists are amazing at. So one of my examples here is uh, a really amazing uh, opportunity. I had to host the future of visualization manifest art in uh, in the backyard of the Wanton Lyman Hazard House in Newport. Uh, it was founded by the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. And on paper, it is essentially an intellectual uh, activity where we had uh, choreographers, poets, musicians, and historians um, perform a night in the backyard of the Wanton Lyman Hazard House um, that responded to the Black Lives Matter movement. From a visitor perspective, however, um, what was happening uh, to the majority white audience, let's be honest, was that they were invited to a backyard that they pass every day, uh, to the backyard of a museum that they didn't realize was open for visitation uh, during an evening uh, where they were bringing their own picnic blankets, their own friends snacks, uh, and to really deeply dive into racial injustice and the history of positive um, lifestyles and, and black history in Newport as it relates to some of the artifacts at the Wanton Lyman Hazard House uh, that really speak to black creative survival. Um, so the actual narrative that I am breaking or that we try to break at Newport Art House is yes, if your curatorial department does not include POC indigenous folks, um, I, I think it's okay and I would encourage you to acknowledge that. If you like to use labels, then put it on a label. Uh, the interpretation of a site is not complete. Fine, that's great self-accountability, we love that. But the narrative we're really breaking is that young people and POC folks cannot like or be um, interested in the history of your site. Uh, I know that you know that that is not true. Um, in our programming, we really love capitalizing on uh, juxtaposing this conflict. Um, for example, during the um, Newport Arboretum, uh, tree funeral, Newport Art House was invited to have an art exhibit um, called Art of the Arbor, where we, where we had uh, Vinegar Avery's dance troupe create a choreography uh, that they call the tree funeral. Um, what's really awesome is that they're a queer identifying dance troupe from Providence, um, and they're performing at the Elks Club, which is a general. On the side, you'll see an interpretation by visual artists of the Wanton Lyman Hazard event. Uh, future visualization, right? And just bringing those perspectives in uh, is really important. The artist's name was Nicole Fabulous. Another example of breaking the narrative here is our anti-gala event. Uh, it was definitely satisfying to invite young people of all echelons on a sliding ticket scale to enjoy an art festival of 50 performance artists uh, in the backyard of one of Newport's uh, most stunning mansion gardens. Um, we got reviews about how um, this event really was revolutionary, not necessarily because of the artists, uh, even though, of course, that was the main reason everyone was there, but because of the access. Uh, a lot of these people had never imagined that they'd be able to attend an event on the scale, and that has to do with class and access and race. And we were very happy to be able to provide an evening like this that really did celebrate the Newport Arts community. And in red, um, up on the upper right side, you'll see our planning committee, um, which is a bunch of 30-year-old women, basically. <laughs> um, and Jamie Bova attended and said she'd never seen so many young people in one place, which is a huge accomplishment for us. So if you, as an org, have in your core competency to uh, contact artists directly, I highly encourage that. Uh, and if you, need, if you need something in addition to that, there are many freelance artist curators in Rhode Island. Um, they have experience uh, in liability, creative uh, programming, project management, and they have a network of artists that they trust and enjoy working with. Because in the end, um, what you're doing is you're creating connections between people and you're creating uh, 
memories. Um, I, I really snicker and giggle at this interaction between two of our vendors at the Baffle Market at the Decatur House, um, because that building was obviously um, built by a captain who participated in um, the slave trade or some sort of branch of it. And uh, today uh, we're all welcome there and you can have a delicious taco there. So there are lots of layers um, to this. Basically what I'm saying is that when we're experiencing our own present considerations um, in a historical site, we will remember that historical site better. I mentioned the Hogshaw Farm where I uh, off hours attended uh, an outdoor movie projection and one of the bulls got ran loose. Uh, and I will never forget that night. Uh, I know you might not have farm animals that can provide that type of entertainment. If you're trying to do something more conscious. You can create that sense of wonder uh, and, uh, and access um, by, by, by participating in the process that contemporary artists are so amazing at. So in closing, I'm going to say that experience-based artists and programming at your site creates a dynamic where people are allowed to relate who they are, what they're already feeling and thinking, to the solutions offered by digging into historical events. Um, you might risk losing some time in expanding your narrative and getting this new audience, uh, but mainly uh, by engaging with artists at your site, you're acknowledging that you see a future for your site. Um, as I mentioned, that's what we, the future generations, want at your site. Uh, in another way, by engaging with contemporary thinkers, you're acknowledging and messaging that you have a multi-generational, diverse, and relevant vision for the future of your historic preservation site or museum. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. Um, I have a preservation kit that I will be publishing as a book, um, but I invite you all to contact me directly if you want to brainstorm about something uh, that you're planning for your site. That's a courtesy. Uh, I always like to hear about future projects. So thank you once more. Thank you so much, Tracy and Jasmine. That was uh, wonderful. Um, so if people have any questions, feel free to add your questions in the queue box. I know uh, time is really tight and the way this is set up that we will actually go off, um, off air, as it were, in six minutes. But in the time that remains, um, quick questions for each of you. I mean, I, I think so much of what you're both bringing to us right now through all of the work that you have done over many, many years, um, and thank you for that work is you know showing how much what we're talking about here is really storytelling and the fact that the stories that we are interested in telling and hearing and being a part of now are changing um, and sometimes you know artists have a handle on those changes um, and are able to kind of um, reflect and really grapple deeply with these changing stories and with these truths uh, more quickly than historic sites necessarily that may have long, you know, staff who've been in place for a long time. So I'm just wondering, you know, for each of you super quickly, um, you're obviously personally deeply invested in this work. What do you hope the impact to be in the work that you do? Maybe you first, Maybe Jasmine. First, <laughs> That's a really um, big question. Um, I, I think I want people to feel something um, and whether they feel uncomfortable or confused or inspired or whatever it might be, I really want them, you know, I want, I want a kick in the gut um, with um, these histories that we're um, challenging and exploring. And I, and I hope that they can start a dialogue um, of some sort and also like an acknowledgement that like, you know, we do need to think about histories and time um, different and differently. And we need to just acknowledge the past and understand that it surrounds us instantaneously with our, um, with our present and our future. So yeah, I think, you know, if, if I can create or evoke a feeling that um, then starts a conversation and, and from there maybe start something else, that's a plus for me. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to thank you for your work, Jasmine, and the work of all artists who really put their heart and soul full time into it, into understanding human emotion. Uh, that is a core competency that is really hard to learn and isn't really taught anywhere. And I think historians and historical sites who do have such a important 
such an important story to tell. We have so much information uh, we're, we're preserving for this future person who needs to know. Um, it can be interpreted in real time with what's happening through the use of artists. I think that that's a, such a no brainer uh, to, you know, you, you hire a, a, a mortar expert when you need to repoint your facade. So you should hire an artist when you're trying to grapple with important information and when you're trying to create an engaged contemporary audience. Um, and I can tell you that I just so, just years of people telling me that historical sites are boring because I work at historical sites. And it's just like, oh my God, what can we do? Uh, it's not in our core competency as historians to be as engaging as we would like to be, some of us are, which is awesome. Uh, but really go and seek out the help. And I think that's what I wanna see our historical sites that are remembered and preserved and enthusiastically talked about by people in our generation, uh, by people of all different races, whether or not they ended up bawling their eyes out uh, at the end of their tour or whatever. Hopefully there's a place for them to sit and bawl their eyes out because that's important. Um, but that's the type of interaction that I want to see because um, a lot of historical sites in this country um, and a lot of people don't care as much as they could if we put the effort into it. So thank you, Jasmine, for doing your work. <laughs> I think what's amazing is I think what both of you are saying it through your work and also through these presentations. You're you're really thinking about how these historic sites from the past, how they matter today in the present, and how they're going to matter in the future. And I think that's really different and important that you know you're really asking those questions, not like preserve it in amber because it was important in the past. You know, there's really none of that, I think, in this conversation. It's more thinking about what is the relevance today? How can it be useful today? And, you know, how are we thinking about the future? Which I think is really important. If yeah, I can add one, oops, sorry, oh, so, so. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I want us to do better. That's all. Like, we got to do better. Um, humanity needs to do better. So I think, like, you know, looking at again the past and the present and the future simultaneously and um and you know having conversations and doing better on that is um is my goal yeah yeah and in closing i think that um you know when we think about basically if we think about it as media important media historians create narratives that are important media artists create narratives that are, his, that are important media uh the the novelty of how we present the information is targeted towards an audience that grew up with radios i like i can't get over it uh and that is just not the reality of how to build uh supporters that sustain organizations into the future and uh, it needs there's an urgency here um, that i'd like to underline in including bipoc stories artists and uh, the media that we participate in. Yeah. And I think and what I you're think both you're bringing to is, is, you know, these you sites know, these are sites. sites of history, but Jasmine, the word humanity is just so important here. Um, and I think that's kind of the power of the work that you do and the work that you're enabling and really developing, Tracy, too, is the, hum the, the kind of central part of the humanity in these stories and these places, and that's sort of what is so important about them. Um, well, thank you. Any last thoughts in 15 or 20 seconds? Thank you so much. Thanks for your work. Um, and then for everyone out there, I think, you know, if you're a visitor at historic sites, um, you know, look for opportunities. Look for these opportunities to go back to places you've been to hundreds of times before, tens of times before, and see them in a new way if these are sites that are working with artists and i think if you're working with a historic site if your staff um, is really to think about the way that you can work with artists to open up new doors open up new stories new perspectives on a place that maybe you think you know but it's time to re-see in a new light um, with new histories so i think that's hopefully the takeaway and um, thank you, Jasmine and Tracy, for sharing um, for sharing your work. It's incredibly inspiring and very moving too. Thank you, everyone. Thank everyone, you, Tracy. Thank you. thank you, Marissa. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Have thank a great everybody. rest of your conference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.